Welcome to this talk on Big Data Analytics, Lessons in Governance, Ethics and Trust, taken from a COVID-19 experience. It will help us to begin to understand some of the very, very important questions about how to use analytics effectively. As a by, by way of introduction, well, I'm Richard Self. I'm at the University of Derby as a senior lecturer. And I'm an intuitive model. I've been building models for many, many, many years, ever since I started, um, well, since I left school. I became interested in governance about 15, 18 years ago. And that's to do with how do we make our technology effective? How do we deliver business value? As a lecturer, I have many students working with me and around me and for me, and I get them to do a lot of research that actually feeds into many of my presentations. And we've learned many, many lessons. We've learned lessons about models. We've learned lessons about assumptions that underpin those models. And we've learned something rather interesting about the science and the engineering that goes into some of these things and how science and engineering relate to each other. It's very, very important, that one. Now, as we move in, I want to be talking about models. I'll be looking at what are models, how do we think about models, how do we use those models for thinking. And then from that come three crucially important lessons, which I think probably more than at any time in my career, these last few months, very much focused on some critical answer, uh, questions which we need to be thinking about that turn into lessons about our models, about our analytics, about our AI and our machine learning. And those lessons are very simple, it appears. But they are so important. Look out the window. The fact that science is important and that sometimes engineering will not be able to fix science. So let's have a little look at what models are. A model is defined as an abstraction of reality, a simplification of reality. It removes many of the complexities that we have in our models. Remember that maps are not the territory. This is from Count Alfred Korzybski back in the early 20th century, the guy who created the field of um, understanding called general semantics, looking at meaning. We know that model that maps are not the territory. We, we look at an ordinary street map and we recognise that the widths of the roads are unrealistically wide compared to the size of the, of, of the, of the town. We know that when we look at the map, it looks as though the whole of the city, the whole of the countryside is covered in concrete. And yet when we go up 30,000 feet, 10,000 metres in an aeroplane, we look down and we can hardly see those little tiny narrow strips of concrete. So we know that the map is not the territory. In terms of these models, this abstraction, because a map is a, is a model of the, the territory, there are two sorts. There's the models that are in our heads that are private, and then there's the models that you have out there that we share. This presentation is a model of my thoughts. It's a model of what I'm going to be talking to you about. It's not the full complexity. As you can tell, I spent one or two minutes talking about these few words here. But the point about models is they actually are based around and in, encompass and include lots of assumptions. Whether it's assumptions of scaling that you have in a, a map, or whether it's assumptions about the data, about the physical world that you are actually trying to get a model of. And when we look at models, there's a, a, a philosopher many, many years ago, decades, centuries ago, called Occam of, um, I forget where he was, but he said, simplicity is best. And you need to think about that. 
We need to have simpler models. We don't need huge degrees of complexity. The next point to think about in terms of models is that analytics, AI, and artificial intelligence, machine learning, all of these are models. They aren't the full complexity of reality. If we think about yesterday, I was watching the, this is a Sunday, uh, the 6th of September. Some of you, of us, were watching Formula One, and we watched how the Ferrari cars were really not very good at the moment. Their aerodynamic models were not correct. They never saw this terrible lack of performance coming, as far as we know. It was only when it got actually into the real world that it starts actually showing those aerodynamic models in the computers weren't quite correct. The question often is, whose is the model? Because that model incorporates loads of assumptions. The assumptions of the person who owns and created that model. But if we think about those assumptions, what are they? Well, we've got uh, model structures, we've got biases. <gasps> biases in the data, we've got biases um, all through the whole machinery. Sorry about that. We, got, uh, we, we try to make assumptions about our data. We want to know why those assumptions were made. We need to think about the models about verification. Does the model meet the specification? And does the model match the world? We, haven't, we always have to make sure that that happens with our models. Whether they are business models, whether we're analysing our markets, you know, all the things that we do with all of our big data analytics, our AI, our machine learning. How do we know, how do we check that they're doing the right thing, that they're actually matching the way the world really works. Because if it doesn't, we might as well give up and throw it away and start afresh and get a new one. So, what we have now, sorry, Yeah. The thing that's important is what are the lessons? We've only got a few minutes left. I want to cover the lessons now. Look out of the window. Now, the point about this is too many people get sucked into their model. They treat the model as though it's the whole world. And if we look at COVID-19 in the UK, if we go right back into the early days, the experts here were looking at their model and it said the doubling time of the infections was eight, six days. And yet, if they'd actually just looked at the JHU data that's being reported every day, they'd have seen it was doubling every three days, or even perhaps every two days. They looked at their model and said, it's the truth. They didn't look out of the window at what was really happening. If we look to even today, when was the start date of COVID-19 in Europe? The models all say late January 2020, 24th of January is the official first date of a, an, uh, an infection. And yet, we know, we've seen the reports, we've seen the medical reports, and these aren't reflected in the dates anywhere. 27th of December, blood tests in France of people with COVID virus. We go back in France to thoracic scans, x-rays of people. And on the 7th, 16th of November, there are scans of people who were being x-rayed because they had flu, but their scans are ev strong, strong evidence of COVID-19. So when did it start? Well, the problem is, you see, all the experts say, where are the bodies? How did we have lots and lots of people being infected without anybody dying? Well, now we are beginning to get some answers. If we look over here, 
England, UK, 5,000 infections a day. And yet, we are now back up to 2,000 a day in the UK. And the difference is fundamental. Lots and lots of people dying here in the early days, in April, March, April, May. Back there, nobody was dying. Here, nobody is dying. Different ways that the virus is spreading through the, through the world. Perhaps back here, it was actually going through lots and lots of younger people. As it is, and we see here, in Ju July, August, September, when the death rate is down to about 13 a day or less in the UK. The proportion of people over 60 getting the virus, being tested with the virus, is actually quite low. Almost all of the rest are youngsters, below 25, 30. And we know that they don't get very ill. So, where? What is the reality? Look outside. Begin to understand the outside world. Other ways of looking at things is here. The excess death monitor. This is the one that's really important. Because everybody describes deaths to different things. Science is enormously important. Oh, the lesson here is, of course, correlation is not causation. Experts have narrow perspectives. Remember, too, one of the problems is the ex decision makers say science can do anything. Fix it. Just go fix. It can be done. But we look at the Bluetooth uh, apps, the distance measuring apps. They don't work. This is why it doesn't... BLE doesn't give good answers for distance because of the physics. There's too many random different parameters that are variable. It just can't be done. And this shows you why. Too many of the readings are far, far too far away. This is where it should have been reading. And we've only got a small number of the readings down at the correct distance. Most of them are, this is a 1 meter 50 test that one of my students did. And here, most of the re readings are way over the distance. Can't be fixed. This is how it will underestimate the risk, dramatically underestimating the risk if we use BLE. Shows you that all of the ways of measuring it, all the orientations we had, underestimate great problem and this one <coughs> this video you really ought to have a look at this one it's really very good um, look at the YouTube uh, one and it shows very simple just holding it there in relation to that uh, two phones and this shows you the physics here is as he turns it round, puts it behind him in his pocket in front of him flat vertically and so on it measures from one and a half metres to 14 metres. That's the physics, the science. So I want to leave some simple takeaways with, for you. Models are abstractions of reality that simplify things. All AI, all analytics, all machine learning is based on models. You have to understand all of your assumptions and the biases in the data. You have to understand the science, the technologies, and everything else behind it. And remember, don't fight science. You will lose. You cannot engineer, engineer your way past science. You will lose. And also, of your uh, model, verify and validate them. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening to me. I hope you find it interesting and that it helps you to get more value out of the work that you are doing for your organizations. Thank you very much.